Okay, guys, welcome back. It's uh, it's lesson 11. This one is not going to have any pretty pictures. In fact, it's not going to be very pretty at all. It's about the analytical approach to solving the Schrodinger equation for the simple harmonic uh, motion for the uh, simple harmonic oscillator. So anyway, but before we get into that, I wanted to recap something we did in class the other day and that is calculating the expectation of x squared in the n equals 4 state of the simple harmonic oscillator. And the idea is to remind yourself what a plus, a minus, and b are. Notice that you can rewrite x as a superposition of a plus and a minus. In other words, the x operator can be thought of as a sum of a plus and a minus divided by 2b, and uh, proceed to calculate. And the key here is to notice that when you square x, you get an operator a plus squared and a minus squared that can't produce any net result when sandwiched between the same, the ket and the bra of the same state. Because a plus is going to take you from 4 to 6, and 4 on 6 is 0. a minus is going to take you from 4 to 2, and 4 on 2 is 0. So those two outside terms don't matter. A plus A minus is just the number operator. It always produces just the number of the state, so that's going to give you a 4. And by the uh, what you call a commuter, the commutator of uh, A plus and A minus, you know that A minus A plus is just A plus A minus plus 1, so that's going to be the N plus 1 operator. That's going to give you a 5. So when the smoke clears, all that, all that stuff does is give you 4 plus 5 or 9, which means the final result is just 9 times the uh, h-bar over m omega. Of course, you may remember that h-bar over m omega is the uh, square of the oscillator length. So this is really the, it's 9 times the oscillator length squared divided by 2. Okay, now back to business. Uh, first, in order to solve the Schrodinger equation directly using traditional approach of partial differential equations, we want to scale it. So if you look at the time-independent Schrodinger equation, you'll notice there's a bunch of factors there. The plan to scale it is to divide both sides by uh, basically the ground state energy, what we know will become the ground state energy, uh, 1 half h bar omega. And when you do that, it get, becomes rather symmetric. You'll notice there's an m omega over h bar, which is 1 over the oscillator length squared in front of the x squared. And there's a h bar over m omega, which is the oscillator length squared, <clears throat> in front of the second derivative with respect to position. So overall, these terms are all unitless. Um, 1 over the oscillator length squared times x squared is a unitless ratio. And when you take a derivative with respect to x twice, you're dividing by length twice. And so multiplying by the oscillator length squared gives you a unitless factor all, all together. And of course e divided by e0 is unitless. So this this becomes a, sort of a unitless equation and um, as long as we th uh, rewrite psi as a function of the ratio of position to the oscillator length. So we're going to replace x by a variable called xi, <coughs> which is x divided by the oscillator length. So, and you rewrite the differential equation using xi as a variable. It's just minus psi double prime plus xi squared psi is equal to k times psi, where k is now the ratio of the energy to the ground state energy. Okay, so the next thing we want to do is to factor out the asymptotic part. And uh, Let's see, so if we look at that differential equation, it's got the psi double prime um, plus xi, xi squared psi is equal to k psi. If we go to large values of xi, the left-hand side has to practically cancel. The k doesn't really matter. It's a finite amount, but xi squared gets very large, and the second derivative is going to have to get very large in order to practically cancel those out. And so you get a solution that's just e to the minus c squared over 2, ignoring the k. And the idea is, what if we factor that out and see what's left over? We're going to find out what's left over is uh, some kind of a polynomial. But if we do that, we define f 
to be um, the exponential part, the Gaussian part. We know f prime is going to be the derivative, and it turns out that's minus c times f. f double prime, if you work it all out, is c squared minus 1 times f. And if you put all that back in to the differential equation, um, what you find is that, uh, we'll get to it here, there you go, you get this relationship between the second derivative of the h part, the first derivative of the h part, and all the c's and f's. So f, remember, is the Gaussian part. You'll notice there's a common factor of the Gaussian part here. And uh, that means that we can basically ignore the Gaussian part since it's a common factor. And we are left with a differential equation only for the other factor, the h. <coughs> now you'll also notice a couple of things cancel here. There's a minus h c squared and a plus h c squared. And when you get rid of that, you get a simpler differential equation here that, uh, that we can solve. And how do you go about solving such an equation? Well, the only really general method is to assume that the h is some kind of an infinite series. And so we write h as an infinite series uh, on the c, the different powers of c. And then we calculate h prime, which we need. And we calculate h double prime, which we need. And we plug those series back in to the original differential equation. And, uh, and what do we get? We get um, something like this. Now notice that I've got a c to the n minus 2 power, a c to the n minus 1 power, and a c to the n power. And uh, after I multiply through the c in the middle term, I want to rewrite these so that they all have the same power of c. So the only term that's bad now is the left-hand term. I want to change it to c to the n. So I'm going to replace n and n minus 1 with n. Uh, let's see, I want to replace it with n plus 2, n plus 1. And then I get c to the n in that sum. And now I can take the sum to the outside. And you'll notice that... Uh, I have a common factor with c to the n. The only way that can work is if that common factor is 0, because the c to the n are independent functions, linearly independent. So the only coefficients I can put in front of the c to the n's and still have this whole equation work is 0. So that means that I can write a recursion relation between c to the n plus 2, and, or c sub n plus 2, and c sub n. So if I know c sub 0, I can calculate c sub 2. If I know c sub 2, I get c4, c6, c8, and so on. <clears throat> OK, but notice that uh, this thing gets bigger and bigger and bigger unless one of the c sub n's is 0. So the only way to work this thing is if we make one of the c sub n's 0. And the only way to do that is to make the numerator 0. So that means k, at some point, has to be equal to 2n plus 1. That is, in fact, um, a quantization condition on the energy. So k, remember, is e divided by e0. That means e has to be e0 times 2n plus 1. Remember what e0 is, is h bar omega over 2. And so we get a quantization condition that the energies have to be h bar omega times n plus a half. That's the same condition we got with the operator method. So <clears throat> the, uh, the other thing is the recursion relation determines every other coefficient. So all you need is c0 and c1. So uh, what we do in practice is to we separate out uh, solutions that have c0 equal to something and c1 equal to nothing and c1 equal to something, and c0 equal to nothing. Those turn out to be the even and odd solution, and they're called the Hermit polynomials. Hermit, I guess most Americans say. French pronunciation is Hermit, and uh, he was a French guy. And uh, for an example, let's say we want to stop at n equals 4. That means k has to be 9, and uh, that means if k is equal to 9, if you know c0, you know c2 is negative 4 times c0 you know that c4 is 4 thirds times c0. And then, of course, uh, there is no n equals, or there is no c6, because we're going to stop at uh, 
at k equals 9. So that means we end up with a Hermit polynomial, uh, c0 times this thing. Now there is a convention. The convention is that the highest coefficient is 2 to the n. So the highest coefficient in this case is c0 times 4 thirds. That needs to be 2 to the 4. Of course, um, 2 to the 4 is 16. So the only way, let's see, the only way that works is if c0 is equal to 12. Good. And uh, if you plug that back in, you get h4 is 16, c to the 4th, negative minus 48 c, c squared plus 12. So just multiply that all out. And, uh, and that's the way you generate the Hermit polynomials. This gives us a gen general form for the uh, nth simple harmonic oscillator wave function that looks pretty ugly. If I put it back in terms of x, real space, uh, all the xes become x over x0, and the normalization factor, I need to get a square root of distance in there somewhere. And the distance that turns out to be the right distance is the um, oscillator length. That comes in from the dxc, because dxc is dx over x0. And, uh, and that's the way it works. And of course, just to remind you, the oscillator length is the square root of h bar divided by m omega. We got that when we rescaled the Schrodinger equation. Now, last little bit of, of uh, understanding here is that uh, there is a recursion relation between one Hermite polynomial and the neighboring Hermite polynomials in, in n. If I know h0 and h, uh, let's say if I know h1 and h0, I can calculate h2. That's what this thing is telling me. And we can use that in a computer program to generate the Hermite polynomials. So Here's the plan. Uh, we can start our a Python program with uh, the normal starting point. We have a, a size in real space that we're going to study called A. We start with 80 arrows, and we're going to generate 20 Hermit polynomials. So we can have sums of stationary states of uh, 20 terms. And uh, the idea is to begin with an array of arrays. So the zeros function creates an array full of zeros. But notice I'm creating an 80 by 20 array. So each uh, element in the array is at a particular place between minus a over 2 and a over 2 and corresponds to a particular Hermit polynomial. So I'm going to have an h0, an h1, an h2, an h3, like that. And the way we start it is uh, that we know the h0 is, in fact, a constant. It's just 1. Uh, it turns out to be just the number 1. And h1 is actually quite simple. It's uh, 2 times x. You can work those out um, by hand using the recursion relations. Once you have h0 and h1, we can use the recursion relation to calculate h2. So that's the idea. We make a loop. And uh, each time through the loop, we compute the next, the next guy. So n is going to go uh, from 1 to, what's it going to go? From 1 to 19, I guess. And we're going to calculate the n plus 1th Hermit polynomial, just like the recursion relation shows. It's 2 times x times the nth minus 2 times n times the n minus 1th. That's it. And... Uh, and there you have it. So in your program, when you need Hermit polynomials, which you will for computing project four, um, this is a strategy you can use to generate those guys. All right, very good. We'll see you guys next time.